Hello, and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I'm your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today we're joined by Mr. Scott Garrison of DW Drums. Garrison, welcome to the podcast. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah, man. So so your artist relations, marketing, manufacturing, uh, you have quite the reputation uh, of being, <laughs> you know, the DW guy. You've, you've worked with a lot of great people, one of which is Tony Williams, very closely. Yes. Um, yeah. So... Well, let me let me explain real quick first before we even start, because people are probably expecting the symbol episode. It's been moved around. So now Garrison is part three. Symbols are going to be next week. Today, we're going to talk about all kinds of stuff, man. But I'd love to maybe start with just like your audition, your relationship with Tony, all yeah. that amazing stuff. And then we'll get more into the gear uh, from there. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, at the time I met Tony, I was living in the Bay Area. I was going to San Francisco State, and I'd also um, started working for or with other drummers in the Bay Area, being a drum tech. Narada Michael Walden, Michael Shreve, uh, ran around with Steve Smith and did some stuff locally with Michael Carabello from Santana. And this was in between everything else that I was trying to do in life, just get involved in music. And when I was working at uh, the drum shop called Drum World, and it was up at Mission in Geneva, Tony was teaching there. And he would come in, you know, walk past everybody, go into the back, you know, and his students would come in and that was very organized. And then he'd leave. And this was, this went on for a while. And then, uh, one day he just kind of came up to me and said, how would you like to be my drum tech? And I said, well, sure. You know, kind of like, we're just talking about pizza and drum teching, you know? And he said, great. Uh, you got to come over to the house. And I said, great. And he left. But he never gave me the address and never said when, never said, you know, it's like, so then he'd come back in and give some lessons. And then this went on for a couple more days and he never really said anything about it. Like, you know, Hey, so finally I stopped him and I said, um, if I'm going to, you know, be your tech, shouldn't I come over? You know, it's kind of like trying to, how do you break the ice to Tony Williams about? Yeah. Yeah. Know? And he said, well, you know, fine. And he gave me his address and he says, memorize it and then destroy it, lose it. Can't have it. I don't want it out there. And I went, eat it. Yeah. Pretty, you know, get rid of it, burn it. You know, <laughs> so I figured out how to get to his place and we set up a time and I went over to his house and knocked on the door and he said, great. And I don't know if he said great, but it was cordial. And then he said, let's go to sure. the music room. And the music room was a converted garage. The, uh, the side door went into the music room, drum set, you know, CD player, tape players, piano, his music notes everywhere. And then the second part of the garage was storage, was filing cabinets and other stuff. So it was a separated garage. And in there was a double bass DW drum set. It was huge. Three rack toms, three floor toms, a side. Tom. I mean, it was just, and I'm like, wow. You know, because I just remember seeing Tony as two racks and some floors and, you know, and all the stuff that, you know, and now there's yeah. this double bass rig DW, you know, Tony Williams, yellow, red lugs, black hardware. I mean, it was huge, you know, somewhere in my pile of notes here, I have my original notes from that situation and I tell you why it comes up. So he's sitting there and he's smoking a cigar and he's, you know, kind of eyeing me up. And so I'm kind of looking at the kit and I swing around to the back side, and I'm sitting there on, he had a pneumatic throne, so it kind of bounced. And all of a sudden, he kind of like digs into me. And, uh, you know, I'm bouncing up and down. I'm like, this is kind of fun. You know, dig me. I'm at Tony Williams' drum set. And he goes, <laughs> I need my drum set set up like this every single night. And not going to be able to, and blah, blah, you know, and he's just reading me the riot act over a drum setup. And so wow. I'm sitting there, and I'm like, well, that's great. I said, you know, I can do the job, but if you and I don't get along, it's not worth my time. And he stormed yeah. out of the room and I went, well, all right. He left. So I said, like he was having kind of a bad day or something. I, I don't know. I think it little... was, I think it was more of like a testing of the water. Maybe. maybe. Yeah. I don't think it was a bad day. I, can you handle it? Can, yeah, you, can, handle can this you handle this? Do you know who I am? And I'm sitting there going, yeah, well, yeah. you know, you asked me, so I must have something <laughs> or that, or I was just so stupid and naive. I didn't realize what I was doing, but yeah. I just simply said, you know, look, if we don't get along, it's a waste of my time and your time. And so he leaves. 
So he's gone. So what I did is I sat there for a few minutes and I'm going to kind of jump over here to some notes because yep. I've got a pile of stuff here. Um, and I started sketching his kit. You know, I had to figure everything out because the way he sets up is different than Narada. The way he's, you know, Narada is different than Michael Shreve and everybody's got their own little thing. So I started drawing and making notes and I'm going to hold this up in front of the camera and I don't think I'm going to give away any secret recipes and I don't think anybody can read my handwriting. Yeah. It's just extensive note to explain right. for people kind of listening in the car. It's just, right. it's just, a, notes it's just and, a, the typical yellow tablet. And I yeah. sat there and I started writing everything down and, you know, first set up right kick and the second, the top of the snare and the height of the top of the snare was 29 inches on the left side and it was 28 and a half on the right. So there was a slight, you know, downslide. Yeah. And you, so you're measuring, I'm you're, measuring you're everything. Like a, I got a tape yeah, measure yeah. and I'm drawing things and you know, I'm like, okay, so how does this work? Because he's got three racks and he's got three floors and I'm measuring the distance between the floor toms. Cause it was set up in a triangle, like a table. And I'm like, yep. okay, there's a little distance here and I'm measuring this and the height is 28 and a half inches. And then I'm, I don't know at what point either I was behind the kit or in front of the kit. And he comes back into the room, still smoking the cigar. And he goes, what are you still doing here? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and I didn't know that that oh, was my God. cue to leave when he left. Uh, and I said, you said that you need this thing set up exactly like this every single night. Well, I need to know what this is. So I wrote down all your heights, your 13 inch rack, Tom centered first 13, 33 and a half inches up. And I showed him all my notes and he just smiled and he said, okay. <laughs> so, so it was a test. So it kind of was a yeah. test. But when you're told by somebody like Tony Williams, what are you still doing here? You either yeah. your boots are on or you're, yeah. So yeah. I wrote what year was this? Can you was this 94? This is 94 end of 94 beginning 95. I I want to say oh, cuz here's cuz he started receiving the kits from DW in 94 at Drum World okay. where he was teaching and at his house cuz here's the original write up from John Good. And it was September of 94. So Okay. This was the and you kit. you had no connection to DW at that point, no, right? No, I the only connection I had to DW is I was selling them at the shop, and Tony okay, was using them to it. teach on. I I had never met John at that time. Uh, Don Lombardi didn't know. I knew who they were, and but I didn't know them. Uh, yeah, Tony was yeah. the connection to DW, and Got I'm it. sure that you know all my lovely fax because back then you had to fax. You know, you didn't have emails, so I'd fax sure. John Good all these things all the time. Like, oh, John. Tony and I are discussing this and and I'm sure John good would go, Oh great. Another fax from this guy, you know, but it was my introduction to DW drums deep with being with Tony. Absolutely. Got it. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Just to fill in that gap before we move forward, because I know Paul, which I didn't really mention this at first, you know, I I know you enjoyed part one that you've seen that, that, you know, Paul's not here tonight with us while we're doing this interview, but, uh, this is just cool. So cool to have the two of you guys and Paul's on some and you're doing this. It's just, it's just awesome. But so do you know the reason that I'm sure you do? Why did Tony switch from Gretsch to DW? I don't think I know, or maybe I'm forgetting that, that kind of story. What, why did, did he want to switch? He, um, it, he wanted to stick with an American made company and okay. DW was it. Okay. And, um, there was a gentleman working at DW. I, I think this is how it kind of worked. John De Christopher was at DW for a short period of time, and then he got hired by Zildjian. And Tony's a Zildjian artist. And Tony was looking for a drum company. And I believe John De Christopher got a hold of Don Lombardi and John Good and Tony, you know, through different time phone calls. He's looking for a drum company. You're a drum company. We should make this this communication happen. Um, okay. Yeah. And so Got Tony, it. I take that as yeah, 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 yeah. That Gretsch obviously wanted to manufacture things overseas at that point. Is kind of I, what I'm, I don't know that. I mean, Gretsch is still in the U.S. I I just um, it's probably 
the easiest thing to say is that Tony was looking for, cause he was always pushing himself. I mean, there, there was yeah, a yeah. double bass rig in front of me, three rack toms and the three floor toms and a side tom and a snare. And you know, there's a, that picture online. If you go online that we were talking about earlier, that overhead yeah. shot, you see this massive rig and everybody was like, this is not Tony, but it is Tony. Cause he's always yeah. going forward and he's always doing things. And I mean, um, we did a, we're going to fast forward and jump all over the place. Sure, and sure, and sure. unfortunately people that are listening are going, Oh my God, the guys on, you know, sliding all over the place. But <laughs> I started working for Tony and there was going to be an event in LA called uh, drum day LA. And this was a DW production. Don Lombardi had the name drum day LA and Tony was going to do a clinic and then he was going to perform. So we got ready for it. We flew down to LA. We rehearsed at third encore and nobody knew what was going on outside of the immediate us. And Tony was rehearsing rock music. I mean, this was full on rock. We had uh, Bob Daisley on bass from mm. the original Ozzy Osbourne band, Lyle Workman on guitar and Tony on drums. And we rehearsed at third encore to get these songs down and they were going to be performed after the clinic. So we go to house of blues on sunset set up, got his drums there. And Tony comes out and does a clinic, you know, starts off with the snare roll and, you know, and comes in on the cymbals and then hits the right. I mean, it is Tony and the audience is filled with fans and LA drummers. I mean, packed awesome. and Tony does this <laughs> blazing clinic. And then he says, okay, I'm going to come back out in a few minutes and we're going to do a, sh we're going to perform for you. And I don't think people realize what was sitting up on stage when all of a sudden they look up and there's a Marshall stack and an Ampeg <laughs> sitting there and out comes Bob Daisley on bass and Lyle Workman on guitar. And Tony starts playing a rock song, original written rock music, man. And people lost it. I mean, the story goes, and, cause I wasn't in the audience, so I was, I couldn't hear anybody. But the story goes that Joey Heredia said, holy crap, Tony's now playing rock. And, and it <laughs> awesome. startled people. I mean, cause they're just used to, you know, you know, and Tony was always evolving and always pushing it. And that's what, you know, I think one of the reasons why he might've gone to DW, cause I wasn't in the conversation when he talked to Don Lombardi originally. I wasn't sure. Part of, I was still working the, there. Yeah, I wasn't there. Yeah. Still in the Barry working for other drummers up there. And Tony requested, couldn't backtrack a little bit. I found out that Tony called around to find out who all the guys were using as a drum tech and they all pointed at me. And so that's, oh, and wow. then, and then it there just, you go. yeah, it was kind of nice to find out later on that Tony actually did some background checking on me. And I not and just I, walk by you and say, Hey kid. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> you look, you look gullible enough and strong enough to lift this, by the way, it's double bass and all this crap and the symbols yeah. weigh a ton. That's okay. Yeah. So, well, that's what, what I find interesting too, though, is, uh, it's cool that he switched to the double bass, but also it's like when I think introduction, obviously I'm talking, you know, the history of double bass goes way back, Lee oh, Bells and all that, but, yeah. but we know that like 1980s double bass everywhere. Tony didn't jump on the bandwagon and do it then. He no. waited until he was ready and yeah. wanted to and had a reason to do it. Another, I feel like yeah. he always yeah. Yeah, uh, thinks it through. Greg Bissonette, key in helping yes. Tony with the... Uh, I mean, good God, Greg Bissonette, you know. I just met him at PASIC, actually, which I should have come and said hi to you. I was only there for half the day on Saturday, and I saw Greg and... Uh, I saw Greg. I probably nice saw guy. him right after you saw him. But he's he is... Uh, it's so hard to not just smile when you see Greg Bissonette, you know, yeah. you just smile, then you yeah. go, and he's so good. But Tony was with Greg working on the double bass, but the majority, uh, aside from the rock stuff, and, and even then when we did that stuff in LA, it was only a single kick drum. Tony used a single pedal, single kick drum. So, and you see a lot of footage online uh, of him playing and you just hear and he's feathering that bass drum and that just that yeah, yeah, underlying yeah. rumble. And then it's in control. And then he's, you know, and then he's matching whatever he's doing. He was working on double bass because he was pushing himself, you know? Sure. And uh, well, it's, it's kind of wild to think of Tony, like starting new at something, you know what I mean? Like he hadn't always, really, I'm sure he's 
incredible at it yeah. from the start. Always but, his eyes yeah. open, always his ears open. This episode is brought to you by Masters of Maple. Masters of Maple is proud to present the 323 snare drum. The 323 is a love letter to Los Angeles. It embodies everything about where Masters of Maple is from and where this drum is made. It's dark, gritty, and has just enough flash to make it in Hollywood. This drum comes in two sizes. There's a six and a half by 14 and an eight by 14. Each size is limited to a production run of 12 drums. It's got a 1.2 millimeter pure copper shell. It features the new Masters of Maple stump badge and has black nickel plating. The snare comes with a trick multi-step throw off and you have the option of choosing split lugs or tube lugs or die cast or triple flange hoops. So you get to customize this drum. You can pre-order the 323 right now at mdrums.com before it goes live for sale on December 8th, 2023. This is a limited production run and it will go fast. So head over to mdrums.com to learn more. Thanks to Masters of Maple for sponsoring this episode. The story of him talking to Miles at the club when he wasn't in the cl- in Miles's band and the story goes uh, that he walked up to Mr. Davis, Mr. Davis, Mr. Do you, can I play for you? And the story goes that Miles said, ah, kid, why don't you sit down and listen? So Tony sat down and listened. <laughs> And then it comes around a year later that he asks Tony to join the band. I wasn't crazy. there. Yeah. I can't, you know, somebody could call in and go, you're crazy. I was there. He didn't say that. He actually, you know, did whatever. But it's a good story though. It is. Don't it, let the truth get in the way of a good story. Yeah. And you know? I don't, and I've never had anybody correct me. <laughs> no, it sounds right. So it's, it's, you know, so Tony, Tony's eyes were open and he listened and, you know, he had, desire for shells that sang and i think john good and don lombardi provided that as well john good and don lombardi turned the drumming manufacturing world over when when they started you know because john would go out and tech i don't want to i want we'll get back to tony's drums because there's a there's a come i'm coming back yes this is great i'm rowing a boat and i'm coming back to shore (laughs) so John would go out and tech for various drummers and then come back because Don Lombardi had the drum workshop in Santa Monica. And John would say, Mm -hmm. this is what I've learned on the road. And John would then start taking drums and cutting bearing edges and understanding them. And Don was working on hardware and it was a progression of them just putting things together. Don was working on hardware to become better, like a height adjustable canister thrown. Then, you know, he got to take over the Campco lugs and that became, okay, if I've got these, then obviously I got to put them on a shell. And John started realizing that shells had frequencies and timbre matching. So when John would make a kit, and for example, Tony's giant kit, John would tap on each shell. So each shell progressed down sonically. So you didn't have that 13 that no matter what you did sounded higher than your 10, when in reality, it should be a lower fundamental. So there's John doing that with shells and and the history of DW drums is documented and it's all over. And there's, there's an episode with Don Lombardi of the podcast. Yes. I think it was last year. Don actually had an interview with me about Tony and we talked about some of the stuff again, but I think when that Tony was looking for something different, John to Christopher, you know, made a phone call. Don Lombardi's doing his thing. John's doing his thing. And I think that all of that lined up and, and Tony came down and met with Don and John and, and um, yeah. when we just celebrated our 50th anniversary, Don and John were on stage talking about stuff and they started bringing my name up. So I came up on stage and we were talking about how they met Tony and what the first kit was and what Tony wanted and things like that. And one of the first kits, nobody's seen. There's no, I have not found any photos of it. And everybody goes, oh, it's the yellow kit with the red lugs. And I go, it's not. One of the first kits, and it went off to New York, and it is, there it is. This thing is a monster. This thing was 8x10, 9x12, 10x13, 11x14, 12x15, 13x16, 14x18. The 15, 16, and 18 were all on legs. The 11 Mm -hmm. by 14 was going to be on a rim mount, but then they put it on floor tom legs. Two 1824 bass drums, six and a half by 14 snare. This part was essential for Tony's snares from this moment on. All of them had to be 12 lugs, not 10. Mm. So if you look at the, there you go. This photo's up on the internet. 
that's a 12 lug snare, not a 10. So you can't get a tone control on it. Oh man. I mean, it is a lot of lugs on that thing. (laughs) 12, the number 12 was essential for Tony was very important part of him. So this kit is actually called TW yellow over white pearl. And it was, um, like a white Marine finish ply and they painted it yellow and it had brass hardware. I have never seen a picture of this kit anywhere. So it was white Marine pearl paint. So you would see a little of the pearl right. it's finish. The, the white Marine pearl finish ply and John, and I could probably talk to John and confirm that he used ultra white. I think it was ultra white Marine pearl. Sure, and then they sure. misted the yellow over it and then they put okay. brass lugs on it and off it went. This one, this one went out to New York and this is something Tony used at um, Montana studios. So, I wasn't there. This was just prior to me. So I didn't see this kit until we started working together and I went to New York to go through the locker and I found it and I'm like, what the hell? Because all I knew was the monster yellow kit in his studio that, yeah. you know, that I got with lectured red, on with the red yeah, lugs, yeah. <laughs> you know? And so, wow. you know, there's little things that I, I, and it was funny when you said I would, you know, would want to talk to you about, DW drums and Tony's drums. And Paul actually was the first person to contact me about this. Yeah. I didn't really think about how many details there were and there are in Tony's oh, yeah. drums until I, I started going through my notes. Yeah. You know, the subtleties of how he set up and the, the black dots and, and John good being who he was or who he is. I shouldn't say was sorry, John. Who he is. Yeah, and, he, and he, how, what? I'm still here. Yeah, yeah. You know, the door gets kicked open. What are you doing, kid? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what are you still doing here? Oh, it's totally. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, you know, that, that timbre matching genius of him and the hardware that Don came up with was a perfect storm for this situation. And this yeah, kid. Yeah, that time. Yeah. And that, and, that's the perfect DW time yes. right there. And yeah. um, so this kit, I mean, I know where it is, but I'm saying it was there in New York and it kind of did its thing. And then it was left because then Tony got into the TW yellow and I'm trying not, you know, again, back to the yellow that everybody knows. And, yeah, yeah, and, yeah. and as we toured and did stuff, you know, Hey, do you got the clown shoe kit with you? Ah, it's ketchup and mustard. Oh, you know, it, it's a thing. It's a I mean, thing. it's, uh, it's a very much a thing, which again, people just listening, not on YouTube, but the pictures, which I should mention that if people are just listening Sometimes people say, oh, I didn't even know there's YouTube videos. Yeah, there's yeah. YouTube videos that have a ton of photos, but yeah. it's definitely a, a vibe. I mean, oh, it's yeah. the yellow with the red. Uh, did Tony ever talk about that? People's thoughts on the colors? Oh, yeah. We'd laugh. I mean, it, we'd, we'd collect names. You know, what'd you hear? Oh, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's a pissed off ladybug. Oh, no, it's clown shoes. It's Ron Mc- <laughs> You know, there's only so many. Do you can- care? No. Ah. No, I yeah. think I think we giggle. I think it's awesome. Yeah. The yeah. and the and so jumping back, let's go back a little bit to Yellow Gretch. The yellow there's two st- <laughs> there's one story I keep perpetuating because we had a laugh about it and then there's the story that that I kind of think is what it was. Um yellow came about from my understanding because Tony had never seen a yellow drum set. As you and Paul discussed, it wasn't in the catalog at the time. It, ca- it came out later on that poster catalog, you know, yeah, showing yeah, 83 80 or whatever stop sign badges. Yeah. And, um, and I remember Tony saying, well, you know, I'd never seen a yellow kit. So I said, can you do a yellow kit? And Gretch said, yes. And you know, I mean, there's more to it than that, but that's the yeah, yeah, cut yeah. and dry version. So that yellow just became synonymous and it, it it's kind of like, you know, everybody goes, well, yellow is Tony's color. That's like saying amber Vista lights are Bonham's color. You know, it's sure. stuck and you see, and it really does look good as a drum. It just totally. does, you know, yep. Will Calhoun playing the yellow and you had Elvin Bishop yep. and Elvin. Yeah. You know, and one day I'd like to just buy a DW yellow kit, you know, just to say, but I can't, I don't think I can. I don't think I can in good conscious order a yellow kit. having spent so much time with Tony. Yeah. The, the other flip is, or the other story that we always, that this was Tony's genius, you know, cause everybody would say, you know, why'd you pick yellow? Why'd you pick yellow? What's your deal with yellow? And he would say, well, yellow is the color of intelligence. 
you know, as just like a real, like he, like it was like a offhanded comment and it stuck. So to this day, every time I see something yellow, like it's on a shirt or whatever, I go, it's the color of intelligence. We have no, there's no way of knowing if we're right. We're probably wrong. But it sounds right. But it sounds it's good. Kind of it's a like, cute little, yeah. you know. So why did Tony Williams have yellow kits? Oh, it's the color of intelligence. Oh, he must be a smart guy. Yeah. You, yeah. you start doing start doing little things like that. Well, before we move on, yeah. I just got to ask before I forget, you said the 12 lug thing. Yeah. 12 was an important number to Tony. Yeah. Are you talking like sound wise, drum wise, tunability, or are you talking about the number? The number 12. 12. Yeah. His, Can you explain that? His a little birth more? date. 12. Oh, okay. Yeah, 12. Okay. There's 12 hours in a day. There was a lot of things about 12. And, and then when it came to the snare, yeah, tuning 12, 12 lugs, very important. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then uh, we'll jump back sure. to a yellow Gretsch kit story, but other little tidbits about Tony's kits and, and different time frames of when you saw them uh, was this. Um, the drums were yellow. Lugs were red, and at the time, DW didn't have their mounting system, the STM mounts. They had rims, the old school rims, yeah. and those were black, and those went with the black stands, and then the brackets on the drums were black, and so the legs were black. So the okay. four tom legs were black, and the crutch tips were black, and then we started doing red. So there's only a probably a handful of pictures out there that show a kit with red floor tom leg crutch uh-huh. tips with red. So this was 96, just um, 97 prior to his passing that we started doing this. So you're going to, so if somebody says, oh, I saw a picture of Tony Williams and the legs were black rubber on the floor tom, 94, 95, part of 96. Then we got into, so there's only, I mean, I haven't even seen a photo with this i just know that yeah you know i have a couple of them and the other day i was thinking in a a, something that would be different about this conversation because i again when i started to think about talking about tony's drums and it also brought up the fact that we did things that were not necessarily about the shell it was just little tony isms you know and red crutch tips was it totally yeah detail is is that one of the original? I assume that's one of the original ones from from the from ninety six or seven they, that yeah, you have right there. I had I had yeah. This is yeah. This is an old piece of rubber. Um, wow, when, when, it's it's a special piece of rubber. <laughs> yeah, there's you know in all my notes here and stuff, there was a a fax I sent to John Good, and I said, you know, Tony was asking about those red crutch tips did you get them, you know, or something, something, you know, and cause John got them and he sent me the bag. And so there's some leftover ones cause we never got to put them on all the kits, unfortunately. Sure. So I have yeah. a couple leftover that I have and, uh, that, you know, a little thing of Tony. Yeah. Well, okay. You just said all the kits, how many kits were there? Cause I know he kept some in different spots with Gretsch. We're, Even there was like European kits. I mean, was right. it just one or was there multiple? Um, we'll jump back to the Gretsch thing real quick. When Tony, okay, joined, go for it. when Tony joined DW, um, cause you guys t- or Paul brought it up that Gretsch would sometimes ask for kits back. So Gretsch yes. asked for a kit back from Tony. So we sent it the yellow kit that I sent back to Gretsch ended up being the kit that Alvino Bennett played at the Olympics when the bomb went off. And oh, wow. And there's a nice story online. I think it's under the Gretsch page, but if you Google Gretsch drums, Alvino Bennett Olympics in Atlanta talks about the kit. Alvino Bennett was going to Atlanta to play at the Olympics and asked Gretsch or said to Gretsch, Hey, I'm not bringing my gear and they will, we'll bring you a kit. And they brought him the kit that I had just sent back. <laughs> And then that was the kit yeah. that was on stage when uh, when the chaos happened at the Olympics. And there's a very nice 90, story. 96? 96. 96. Yeah. Oh, and, my God. Uh, Alvino Bennett said a very nice thing. I mean, he's complimenting the Gretches and he's complimenting Tony. And at one point he was talking, he was trying to get the drums off stage because they were so significant to him that security said, look, it's your ass or the drums, you know, or something. Like that. So he, you know, <laughs> so that. I can't believe yeah, that. So that kit that we sent back became that kit. So back to your question about kits that Tony had, um, yeah. I got, I guess I can do a quick count. Well, we had the one that the world has never seen except for a handful of people. And, and I don't know if anybody took a photo, 
There was the teaching kits at drum world. There was the, and the monster kit at his house was actually a combination of two kits. And that's an, a, a story that threw me for a loop and threw John good for a loop. Um, so there's the monster kit, there's the Montana studios kits. And then the Montana studio kit became a yellow kit. Then there was an LA kit. Then there was, uh, Scotland, Japan. So was that seven? Seven. And so, they're all yellow with the red lugs yeah, they, identical yeah, to each other. They're all, yeah. Okay. After the 94 TW yellow yeah. over the white pearl, yeah, they yeah, became yeah. yellow. Um, Got it. Seven kits, man. And, wow. and, uh, but eight, there was a little jazz kit that, that this is the kit that, uh, became the incorporated big kit. Cause when I got to that way back when we were talking about Tony's big kit, you know, he had, he had requested from DW a double bass kit with three racks, the three floors, two bass drum snare, and then a four by 14 side snare over on, and you can see it in some of the photos. Mm-hmm. Um, and then also requested a little 18 inch setup. It was an 18, a 12 and a 14. And that 14 is part of there. And I'm pointing to a photo on screen and you can go online, get a better shot of it. that 14 was part of the little jazz setup. So I was faxing John good going, Hey, these are the drum sizes that we got. And John's saying, those are not the sizes I built him. That big kit that you're describing, those are the wrong sizes. And I said, I'll go back and measure, you know, maybe I'm, I made an error. So this went on for a couple of days. And then finally, John said he combined the two kits. That's why that kit is so big. It's supposed to be a big kit, but it's not supposed yeah. to be that big. <laughs> and He's so just playing and having yeah, fun. Yeah. yeah. So he combined and that's how it became the three racks. And then we finally settled in on, um, what you saw 99% of the time was the 24, the two rack toms, the three floors, in the snare that was the majority of what we did stuff on um all maple shells you know john timbre yeah. matching them making sure they all sounded right and black dot heads and yep. that was the majority of stuff but the big massive kit that stadium kit was going to be the big stadium tour when the rock album came out and when the rock tour happened that's what you would have seen and Man. you know but That'd that unfortunately that didn't happen but that's yeah. you know that's the way it goes but and then there's a black front bass drum head in a picture i'm looking at a 94 drummers collective has the dw logo and it looks like it has the zildjian logo on the bottom yep which is interesting because a lot of the stuff we talked about with paul was unless it was a specially set up uh photo shoot or something a lot of times he didn't want the gretsch logo on the front he didn't want the badge for Gretsch. That would always be kind of turned away with the tone control right, and stuff. Right, right, yeah. But now he's got Zildjian. He's got DW. Yeah. It seems like he had a bit of a bit of a change of heart, you know? Yeah, I mean, you know, part of it is you want... Well, if you look also in the background of that picture, there's a big Zildjian banner. There's a giant Zildjian banner. Giant. I guess this it, is Clint. It's Clinic. Clinic. Yeah, Drummer's Collective. <laughs> and of course, you're now at the point where, where drum companies are... And just like any other company, you want that logo recognition. And True. DW kits go out with DW logo heads and that's a DW. And just below that is our other DW logo and Zildjian came up and went <laughs> with their bo- the yeah. logo and there it is. Sticker. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. You want, you want the brand recognition. I mean, yes. you know, even Tony understood that because, you know, his album uh, Wilderness that we recorded in LA, he was working on, you know, his logo, you know, on the back recognition. He was, he understood that. Um, you know, all, you know the, that kit that you're looking right there at the collective. There, that became the majority of everything because that's two racks, three floors, and there's the snare. Uh, if you go online, there's a clinic that Zildjian put on. Zildjian had a Zildjian day in Scotland, and Tony's mm-hmm. thing there. And you know, you, Tony's just doing his thing, and it's it's. I hope everybody, you know gets a chance to go online and find footage of Tony, Tony playing on DW stuff, Tony playing with miles, to, you know, the stuff he, you know, uh, when, when he left miles and it was McLaughlin and, um, Larry young, it, I want to say not because I worked for Tony and not because he was my friend, but I'm willing to give him the tip of the hat that that was the beginning of fusion. They are the ones. That's what Paul said. Now, yeah. 
Now, I'm sure some, one day I'm going to be walking down the street. Somebody's going to throw a, 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 a grapefruit at me and go, you know what you're talking about. You know, Fusion was started by this guy in Brooklyn. Fine. Yeah. Great. I'm going to still stick to that because it it rifled so many things. And then then they got Jack Bruce. And, you know, I, I was going through a bunch of old footage of stuff um after tony had passed and you can find it on I, oh god i hope it's still online but there's tony and montro and maybe i have it somewhere but i think larry's sitting there with like a like a chic hat on like you can't even see and he's playing and tony's got this two this the setup where there's just like two 18 inch ride symbols he's just blazing it's like <laughs> you can't even imagine how quintessential that was and and i just you, you know, and a lot of that music yeah. is hard for people to hear. They just, they just go, it sounds like everything's coming at you at once. And yes, okay, that's a valid statement. But if you, if you don't look at it and you listen with your ears as opposed to listen with your eyes, you're going to hear it a different way. Then you can open your eyes and, and hear it again. It's, and that's why when you see these clinics of Tony and then drums and how he played them and how he sat and how he commanded them and how he wanted them to speak. I'm going to jump back. I think that's one of the reasons why DW appealed to him because DW was also pushing the envelope as well as making the drums and making sure that it was a complete instrument, not just here's a random Tom and here's a random drum and good luck to you, son play like mad. <laughs> no, yeah. Tony and it, it, it DW allowed drummers to be drummers. And Tony was, you know, clearly ahead of so many things because there's stories. I mean, I think it was the Zildjian day because Vinny Caliuta was playing Zildjian and you might be able to find the footage, but there's a photo or footage. And if you look, Vinny Caliuta is on the side of the stage, just looking up at Vinny. I mean, hmm. Vinny's looking up at Tony, excuse me. Vinny's on yeah, the side. Yeah, that says a lot. You know, and he's just watching Tony and he's just doing that ride thing. You know, another drummer to talk to is uh, Terry Bozio. Bozio knew Tony and oh, talked really? about the yeah. ride and the ride symbol, but Vinny in that ride thing. And then back to DW drums, big drums. John, uh, John got requested by Tony to make big drums. Tony, you could see the evolution of drums with Tony. 18, you know, and as music progressed, drums progressed, sizes. Absolutely. You know, and, and it yeah. pulled you in. And, and Tony's not going to sit there and go, well, I'm not going to play an 18 the rest of my life. We're getting a 24. And at one point we had a 13 and a 13 rack, two 13s, huh. different depths. Wow. And, but yeah. we, but because of the drums, we could tune them, you know, and we had a sequence and I have in my notes what the drums were to be tuned to. And oh, wow. Very particular. Yes. I mean, he knew he knew what he liked. Yes, yeah. yes. And people would come up and say, you know, could you explain to me? You know, they go up to Tony. Could you tell me what you tune your drums to? And he would say, no. But not like me. Not like you know. No. It was like no. This <laughs> is mine. And what you need to do is you need to find yours. You know. Sure. Get your yeah. drum set out. Figure out your head combination, and play and start to find yours. And you know. Tony did. Tony had a certain way he wanted the drums tuned, and I had to do that. As time went on, I kept pushing him to change up things. You know, I, you know, the, the symbol conversation will be another one, you know, because he had a K ride forever. Everybody knows him as a K. And, yep. uh, there's, you know, the Armin Zilden story, and I'm going to, I'm going to edit my swearing. Um, but Armin <laughs> would say to Tony, the, the way you play that symbol is, effing beautiful you know and and john de christopher can back me up on that one so you can get a hold of john de christopher yes, and he could say that sure. that's, but you know then tony again experimenting with drums and you know love the maple because maple's so explosive and expressive i got him into an a custom ride and so we had a different sound and then i put on yeah. a coated snare head and then i would at the the kid at the house i changed all of the heads. I said, will you let me just tune it my way once? I'll change all the heads, tune it up. And if you hate it, I'll change them all back to black dots. And so, there, <laughs> so there's a whole day, you know, and you need, you know, drills. No, you had to do it by hand, you know? So. <laughs> yeah. There's like 600 drums to do it on at that point. So. 
Yeah. Can I get a drink of water? No? Okay, yeah. that's all right. I'll no. keep going. <laughs> and so I tuned the kit not to his notes, but to the shell in the room. And, you know, he didn't say anything. He just played it and time went on. And Colleen, his wife, came up to me and said, he really loved the fact that you tuned the drums. But he wouldn't really? tell me that. Wow. Yeah, but she told me. And I was like, oh, wow, I'm put that in my pocket. You know, here's a coin forever. But, yeah, but he went back. He reverted back to his normal way. Yeah, we went to on. black dots were, were, were essential him. for him. Um, top and bottom. Top and bottom. But I did get, uh, you know, at times when, when you were in the studio, because he'd do brush work, I'd go coated head. You can, we're going to do a coated head on this. Yeah. And, you know, and then uh, back to talking about the logo head and how, you know, Tony didn't like certain things or changed up at certain things. You know, he didn't always have to tell you. He would just simply make a decision. We went into yeah. a studio in LA and I brought the kit in and I tuned it up and we were sitting there and the engineer was coming in to bring in the mics and I just finished tuning the kit and the engineer gets down and he starts to undo the front head. And I go, what are you doing? Mm. He goes, oh, I got to put the <laughs> mic in there. And I go, no, you don't. No, you don't. No, no, dude. This is, this is Tony's kit, not your kit. Yeah. But this is what we, and I go, I'm telling you, yeah. you, you know, put the head don't back do on. Don't do this. You're, you're good. He's going to come in and I'm telling, you know, I'm trying to warn this poor kid. And he was older than me at the time. So I don't know why I'm saying kid, but yeah, yeah, yeah. Tony comes in and smoking a cigar, you know, in a studio, you know, <laughs> yes and no, not so, not so politically correct, but it is what it yeah. is. Yep. And, and he goes, what's going on here? And I said, trying to tell him that you don't want the front head off. And he's trying to say the only way to record this. And Tony said, well, what did my tech tell you? And the guy says, well, he said to leave the head on. And he goes, well, he's right. Put the head back on. So I had to put the head back on. We tuned it up. When I recorded, when I would do work with Tony live and when I recorded him, we had a mic inside the kick drum, but it was a PZM style. So it was that. Sure. Like a flat, like a yeah. boundary mic kind right. of thing. Yeah. And I could yeah. run the line out between the head and the bearing edge because it was a tiny little thin line. It was a sure. So there would be sure. that inside, there would be a beta 52 in the front and a beta 52 on the batter. So we could do three mics or two mics or whatever it was, but we didn't put a hole in the front head because that was part of Tony's sound. That was part of the drum yeah. that spoke that, and you can, when you see Tony play or hear him play, because you guys were talking about kick drums and tone earlier, Paul and you were. Yes. When Tony got on a 24 DW, there was a tonal difference from Gretsch to DW and part of it was the tuning and those heads being set up there. And it was mm, part yeah. of his sound and that yeah. and all felt beater was also essential. Well, and there's, I just going to throw it out there that there is a sure microphone ad with Tony where he has in his little list of, of things. There's yeah. a, there's the, the PZM microphone yep. on there. Yes. And I, I remember Paul and I talked about that and we weren't sure if he used that live because there were certain photos where there would be like a, I think it was Japan in the seven in the eighties or seventies or eighties, where there was a looked like a Sennheiser, like a four twenty one, yeah, miking the back, yeah. the batter head, yeah. But they wouldn't have been using the 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 PZM mic on the inside at that point, I imagine. I don't but think there was so. no. I don't. There was no mic on the front of the head though, which is interesting. Yeah, no, so. we we would do a lot of miking on the batter side because of that that beater, you know, and how he played yeah, yeah. and controlled that bass drum pedal. The mic was right there. And then, you know, I got to do some experimenting with him when we would go out and do shows because I could drop a mic in, on the, the batter side, the PZM inside, or if there wasn't the PZM crapped out or if something happened or if I didn't have it, whatever it was, a mic on the front. So we had mic batter and then the same thing. Yeah, I'd sure. Double mic the snare, double mic the hats, but there was no hole in the front head. That was not part yeah. of his sound. Yeah. Yeah. You know? All right. Well, while we're in gear kind of talk here, yeah. which the whole thing is gear talk, but let's let's maybe dive in a little bit to um, in no particular order. You sure. pick, you choose, let's say pedals, mm -hmm. hardware, and then maybe we get into the the symbols. Paul's going to do a whole deep dive symbol thing about the 60s and the 70s and all that. Yeah. But I'm really curious about your experiences with that, with getting into a customs. But yeah. I, I don't know. Let's maybe start with the hardware, like like the pedals. Was he, did he switch to DW? When he switched to DW, pedals? it was all DW, all stands were DW, all pedals. 
um, Throne was a rock and sock. He loved the because DW okay. didn't have an airlift at the time. Yeah. So Tony liked the airlift rock and sock because it, it got him up higher. He would, you know, gotcha. if you see photos of Tony, he's up high. He's not, oh, you know, yeah. he's I've not seen down that. behind. Yeah. He's driving. He's like into the kit. You know? Practically standing. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Not, not Chester Thompson high, you know, or, no, no, no. or Mick there's, there's some pictures where it's like, holy cow. Yeah. Or Mick like Fleetwood, you know, high. Mick Fleetwood's like, you know, yeah. But no, Tony sat high yeah. because it was, you know, he commanded this, you know, this is where I sit and this is what I'm in charge of. And these are the drums I'm in charge of. And, yeah. and that was important. Um, so all DW five thousands or like five thousand what, what? So okay, chain drive cool. five thousand the the tried and true cool. single chain five thousand pedal but an all felt beater. Um, okay. DW has that one hundred one beater where it's uh, felt and plastic, which is a, a yeah. great. I turn it around. I use the plastic side on mine. Um, but Tony all felt beater, and and that again part of his sound. You you know, and and I I did like the fact that people would come up to Tony and ask him questions like, you know, this and, and can you show me, he would show, you know, he would talk about stuff, but he, he would still cut it short because he wanted people to get enough information that they would go get their own. Uh, the tuning yeah. thing. Will you tell me what you note you tuned your kit to? No, not because I don't like you. Not because <laughs> it's because you've got to go and do your thing. And, you know, yeah. and that's important because it's, you know, I, I, I couldn't, you know, if I started to play Tony licks, you know, if I started to do that ride thing and, you know, I still couldn't sound like him. I could do the Swiss triplet, you know, Hey, that's a Swiss triplet. Yeah, it doesn't yeah, yeah. sound like Tony. It just does. No, that's the, I want that Tony ride. And yeah. it's like, well, you'll never find it because it's, it's Tony. It's, mixed it's with Tony. It's his stick, but it's really just Tony. Tony. Right. And yeah. we were in LA since we're jumping all over the place. We, we did uh, the, we'll jump to symbols, the yelling of the symbols and then a thing. Before he yelled yeah. at me about the symbols, we were in LA and we were standing out in front of the studio and I'd never, I didn't take any lessons from him because I was there. I could watch it. And I knew people like Rob Hart and people would go and take deep dive lessons because Tony was going to make an entire program on lessons. You know, it was because you would at the time, this is when you, you could release VHS tapes and this is volume one and volume two and vol Tony had a plan for a lesson plan. And these students were part of it. Um, just like Tony had a plan for a rock album. And then he had a plan to do soundtracks. And we were going to move to LA. Because yeah. he actually asked me one day, he said, would you mind moving to LA out of San Francisco? And I went, eh, sure. You know, if you're going, I'm <laughs> right, going. Whatever. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I didn't take lessons from him. But one day, I'm going to reach over here and grab a pair of his sticks. Yeah. So people that are, you know. So I had a pair of his sticks. And I just simply said, put out your hands. And I'm going to hand them to you. And I handed him the sticks, butt ends towards him. And I watched how he grabbed them. And he naturally grabbed them like he plays. He just simply grabbed oh. them. And what you couldn't see is I was holding the sticks like he held them. And, and the main thing yeah. was that right hand. And you can see footage when he was with Miles, how that right hand worked all the way up to that clinic in Scotland, that right hand. And so I looked at his hand and I went, got it. And I walked away and he looked at me like, what'd you get? Well, you know, like, and I went, well, because I'm not going <laughs> to take lessons from you. I'm, I'm not going to sit down and go, let's talk about a 30 second roller. You know, I am. Yeah. I'm not that guy. I, I don't yeah. think that way when it comes to drums. So the other story we're going to talk about on the symbols was when I was at his house one day, we were in the garage part of the garage filing cabinets and things just it was the garage yeah there was a filing cabinet and behind the filing cabinet was an army green zipper symbol bag big brass zipper army green canvas bag and i go what's yeah. this what's this and i start pulling on he goes no no leave it alone don't put it back put it back and i keep pulling on it and he's pushing finally i just pulled it out and i unzip it and there's a ride symbol a crash and a pair of hats and there's the cutout on the symbol and you can find photos of it online. When he was playing with miles, there's a symbol and there's missing bits of it. And I go, what are yep. these? And he goes, Oh, those are just some symbols that max gave me. Those were the symbols that max gave Tony. When Tony took over the chair for miles. Unbelievable. And max and Tony, those are like priceless. Symbols. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you know, that's just history sitting there. And, and so, you know, I, course put it back after i got what i you know but those i mean yeah. max and tony i mean tony 
lived with Max for years, you know, and Tony, yeah. you know, so as a, when he was a kid and he would travel there and he would right stay at Max's. Yeah. So, you know, and you yeah. guys kind of t- tipped on a little bit when, when you and Paul were talking about the jazz community and how, you know, there was all these photo shoots and who was there. It was in New York. I mean, you, you went to the Gretsch factory in Brooklyn and picked out your drums. And that's why all those guys yeah. on the East coast were on Gretsch. It was right there, you know, and you yeah. get, and, and Gretsch was the distribution for Zildjian symbols. And then, you know, so all of that fit and that was the New York jazz scene. And it was, I, and unfortunately I wasn't there. I wasn't born, but I mean, of course I would yeah. have been, I would have been falling all over myself at that point. <laughs> <laughs> and then you kind of jump ahead. Now Tony's in California. It's years later, and there's DW drums, pedals, and hardware all there. Zildjian is still a factor in Tony's life. They're on the East Coast, but he's you know that's never going to change. He's going to be Zildjian forever. Yeah. So um, things that are important, you know, and Tony's sound and Tony's efforts and everything he did with the drums, you know, that's why you got yeah. that sound. And people go, "How do you do it?" And you, well you you know tony's tony he, yeah tony's tony all right let me ask you about um it seems like and i'm gonna real quick i'm gonna share my screen here with you paul did an amazing job of resort like finding all these these deep dive yeah pictures but so this one you're saying this is probably the I kennedy know. center well, rehearsal that's what i'm trying to figure out because there's the kit with the red uh lugs and the black hardware and it's set up and I'm trying to remember what this was. Oh, no, wait, is that, or that could have been the rehearsals before we went to Italy with M boom. So Max, so you got Tony's yeah. kit, Ginger Baker's kit and Max Roach's kit. And then that's, I mean, you M- would have been there. Yeah. You, you were, you were here. Yeah. I was in New York. And yes, those who yes. are listening, I'm looking at a photo of Tony smiling at the camera and behind yeah. him is a set of, you know, bells and other drums and percussion stuff. Another drum set that looks like it would have been Max's kit. It's got an old symbol with rivets, Tony's kit. And then on the far right of Tony is another drum set. We did a tour. It was called M Boom. It was Max Roach, Ginger Baker, Tony Williams. And we rehearsed in New York before we went to Italy. And that's the only reason why I could think of there would be three drum sets in a rehearsal spot. And that could have been it. Yeah. I could have been there. Yeah. I don't think that's my photo. I think somebody took that photo. That's cool. And then going to the young at heart photo here. Yeah, that was just, this session. Just to talk about, yeah, like the the setup and and you can take it anywhere you want, but just like he's always had for or at least for a while, he had the middle kind of crash. Yeah. But here there's this really cool kind of splash right, coming off right. of the, Oh god. Talk about I, his symbol setup a little bit. The photo you're looking at, the young at heart stuff, um, is a combination of the big kit and little kit. The little kit, when I say little kit, it means 24 kick, two racks, three floors, snare, hi-hat, and he had the crashes. And you can see that ride symbol. I get excited. That ride symbol yeah, is yeah, actually yeah. an A custom. You can see by the shine. It's not a K. And then sure. coming off of his crash that was over his first rack, Tom, between the first rack and his hi-hat, there's a splash symbol. And then over yeah. to his right, he another splash. So uh, the big monster kit at home had little arms that came out of the top of the cymbal stands. They're the 909s or the 90s. Those are both 909s. It's an, so those who are geeking out on DW hardware, it's a DWSM 909. Which it's, it's, he seems like he's like, I have access to it. I'm yeah. going to play with this. Yes, that's it. <laughs> so uh, let me see if I can find the complete symbol listing of my original notes. I mean, because I, I mean, I haven't, I gotta be honest, I hadn't seen this stuff in so long. I mean, my handwriting is yeah. such chicken scratch, you know, First floor tom, 14 inch center dot with 13 tom. First 13 tom with snare, 28 and a half inches high. You know, all this stuff. And the symbols were 10 inch platinum splash, eight inch splash, same height okay. and angle as 10 inch platinum. So I think, I think those two splashes are both eights though in that photo. Sure. They look about the same size. Yeah, they, and I mean, I, you look at some other pictures, there's like there you a go. custom crash. You can see in that photo, this up above. Um, all right, people yeah. that are not seeing this, there's a photo of Tony on the Monster Monster kit with the 11 by 14 that came from the Jazz kit that he incorporated in this photo. Over yeah. Tony's hi hat is there. You go. You see that splash? It's that's yep. the 10 inch. You can see it. It comes right out over his crash. 
that is wow that looks yeah. i guess that's a 10 inch yeah you're right that's of course you're right what am i saying oh yeah. i know it doesn't mean i'm always right but i think that's the 10 that we use <laughs> you know and there and you're right he you know he did like that symbol in the center of his rack tom so on the big yeah. double bass kit we had a stand when we did the single bass kit we just put it in the 9900 bdm sure which historically there were some photos way back Going back to, uh, I believe the six, the late sixties or seventies, where it was like a hodgepodge of stands to kind of make yeah. it work and fit yeah. there, yeah. which was interesting. But now he's with DW, and it's all now. It's now all nice there's and, uh, yeah, there's, sturdy. yeah. Again, Don yeah. and John, you know, pushing the envelope yeah. on gear. There's the side snare. There's the four by fourteen snare to the left of his Hyatt, and if you, this is a good shot too. You can see straight down the snare, his main snare, black dot. No tone controls, no tone controls. Yes. And there's a, there's a, a, a fax I'd sent John Good when I was working with Tony and it said, you know, blah, blah, blah. We're doing great. Blah, 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 blah. By the way, Tony asked again about tone controls, you know, and John was, I think, <laughs> I think John, John loved the fact that the instrument was, is pure, you know, don't have to have tone controls. And I think, you know, it says, uh, here's my note. He would really love to have the mufflers on the new kit coming up. For some of the other kits, if it's all possible to develop these mufflers for Tony, it'd be great. If it can be done, we need 15 per kit, you know, and, and so please send them and I'll install them. Never happened. The, the, so he liked dialing in the tone control and that was part of his sound, but we using it. Yeah. yeah. I, and now there's an argument to be said, did having no tone controls in a DW kit, you know, change his sound some sure. Maybe it was, maybe it was an unconscious decision that made him, you know, cause we never had them. We didn't have tone controls in those drums. So is that a new sound for yeah. Tony? Is that a new way of thinking yeah. for Tony? I mean, did he, did we stop asking about him? You know, I don't remember. I mean, you know. Sure. Yeah. Ultra wide open hi-hats. Very interesting. Oh, that's, that's a, a Tony thing. Yeah. The trick for, to- I, I'll, I'll share this. Yep. Tony's hi-hats, the distance between the bottom hi-hat and the top hi-hat, because you hear when he starts playing in that left foot start and you hear, and he's, you know, why is it so loud? Well, there's two key things. One was the distance, which was literally make a fist. That's the distance right there. My fist, four knuckles from, you know, the pinky up to the end pointer finger. That's how I measured the open of the hi-hat. Just, I'd take the upper hi-hat, loosen the clutch, bring it up, put my hand on the rod, let the hi-hat drop and land on my hand. I'd tighten it. That was the distance. That was one, one way of doing it or one reason. But the other thing was his hi-hats were 15 inch K bottoms. So the bottom symbol was a bottom and the top symbol was a bottom. So they were thicker. So you got that. You know, so when Tony started going, go, 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 and he'd come on cross on those things, it was it exploded. Two 15 yeah. inch K bottoms, big, brassy, you know, make a statement. And that's what mm, they were. I love that he uses the, the, the old, I mean, this symbol setup is talk about a hybrid. I mean, it looks like we have a pretty heavily hammered K newer K mixed with some, some A's, some A customs. It's. 18 inch pre-aged with the 10 inch platinum splash above it, two 15 inch K bottoms, one 18 inch medium thin, 12 inch effects. Number one, 16 inch K dark crash, 22 K ride, 20 inch thin crash with the eight inch splash above it, 15 pair of rock hi-hats and one 17 inch K China boy. Yeah. This is more cymbals and more drums. As we've said, he's always evolving, but this yeah. is more cymbals and drums. It's just, I mean, he's got a, it's another chapter. Yes. Yeah. And you again, know? it goes back to that first kit that DW did, the one that went to Montana studios. It was huge, you know, yeah. but it, Tony was going to use all this. It wasn't like it was there to fill up space. It was going to be used and we did use them. You know, they yeah. had a purpose. He was always thinking, always pushing himself. There was tones coming in songs coming in. It was going to happen. So, yeah. you know, um, yeah, it's just unbelievable that, you know, yeah, he kept pushing it. The black hardware is awesome too. I mean, the, I love the black <laughs> hardware. I think yeah. that's super cool. That's, yeah. that's, uh, 
And then what, I mean, you, you have the photo up here. What is this? Is this just something in the picture that I'm looking at? I was at, looking or is at that. Something here? I don't know what that, you know what it is? <laughs> now that I glasses? see it, they're his glasses. Yeah. Now that I okay. see it, I want to bet those are his glasses. Okay. There, then you know what it is? It is his glasses because it's forcing me to tell the story. So, <laughs> so we, we fly, I think we flew to LA somewhere. No. Washington. We went to play Kennedy, Kennedy Center Honors. We land and we, this is pre 9 11. So we get off the plane and we're about to go down the luggage claim. And Tony looks at me and says, I forgot my glasses. Go get them. So I run through an airport, past the gate again, you know, past the where they, please get on the plane. Down the runway or the not the the ramps, whatever you want to call them, the ramp, yeah, yeah, yeah. They get on the plane, jump on the plane. There's and I go, forgot some glasses. Go over to a seat. There they are. Get them and come back oh, out. Man. I mean, that's when you could go back on a plane and nobody tackled you. That's the most pre nine eleven story I've ever heard yeah, in my life. Ran back <laughs> onto a plane to get his glasses because he'd forgotten them. Wow. Yeah, and there they are. Yeah, and I think those are them. That's funny that man. they're in the photo. It's. Hard, I'm sure for you, but for every drummer out there to just think of, and this is true with a lot, like, I mean, Neil, all these amazing yeah. drummers, like what could have been, mm. I mean, my God, it sounds like he had so many things planned yeah. and what a, uh, tragic, tragic loss. I mean, the, the, it's just crazy what he was pushing forward with the whole instrument in general. Tony, you know what I mean, yeah. I mean, I mean that, the, that, that had to be a hard day. The rock you know? album. I, I mean, the, the, going back to that drum day LA that, uh, DW put on, you know, when, yeah. when, when Tony comes out, who's this, everybody knows as this jazz fusion guy and you see Bob Daisley, who's just a monster bass player and Lyle Workman who guitar, I mean, soundtrack after soundtrack, I mean, just unbelievable. And they come out sure. and they just start playing and Tony's playing rock music you know, people are like, I'm quitting. You know, it's, 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 <laughs> yeah, it's like, it's a, what can he do? What, yeah. Well, you know, so he, Tony, again, drums were his instrument and his passion. And you go all the way back to when he got that, you know, on that back of that photo, when he's a little kid playing that, that kit sitting yeah. on the kitchen stool, the Radio Kings, yeah. you know, drums as he grew musically drums grew. And that, uh, another good thing. I mean, the drum kit, the American band, dance band drum set you know it's american invention it's it's it came from yeah yeah you know you show the old sock symbols and then how they got to be the hi-hat and you know i mean all of this progression as drums changed tony kept changing too he kept it drums evolved he evolved you know it wasn't always in yeah. sync because tony did take breaks and he you know but i i think that ultimately you know being on a dw kit was good for him um because of the instrument itself being, you know, Don and John, again, changing the way drums yeah. were being made and bearing edges and listening to the shell and making an instrument because drummers is, you know, we got plumber, we got plumbing things and, you know, drums, you're, yeah, exactly. oh, you're a drummer. Yeah. There's, there's more drummer jokes than there are guitarist jokes, lead singer jokes. It doesn't matter. Everybody's going to bag yeah. on the drummer. And we would, yeah. and Tony and I would tell drummer jokes, Hey, do you hear the latest one? And, you know, that leads me to the question of, so you guys, I mean, the first interaction was a little bit like, kind of like you were being tested, but did you guys like have fun and goof around and just kind of on a personal level? Was he kind of a tough <laughs> no. negotiator? I mean, look at he, the smile, man. He was mischievous. He, he, I mean, come on. He seems happy. Yeah. The, God, I mean, there were things, you know, go back and get my glasses, you know, um, we'd be in a hotel and it would be. God knows what hour of the morning or night my phone would ring in my room and I'd pick it up because I knew it was him. Yeah. What, huh, huh, what, what? And he would say, remind me to tell you something tomorrow. And he'd hang up and I'm like, Oh my God, there's nothing there. You're just messing with me. And there was, there yeah. was a time where he would put do not disturb on his phone. So people would call in to the hotel. Oh, I got to talk to do not disturb. You can't, you can't find him. Well, calling his wife would call and he had the do not disturb. So she would call me. And say, will you go down, knock on his door, tell him to call me? And I'd say, of course. So I'd get up, walk down the hallway, you know, whatever time it was, knock on the door. Tony, Tony. Yeah. Colleen wants you to call her. All right. 
And I go, great. I go back to my room, start to fall asleep again. A couple minutes later, the phone rang again. It was Colleen. Did you tell him? Of course I told him. Well, he didn't call me. Go back down. and <laughs> He would make me Man. do this three or four times. He Jeez. knew, you know, and it goes on to when we were in Italy and we played Verona in this huge outdoor stadium, it was Coliseum. It's all rock, you know, and we're all set up and it was Max Road. This is the M boom stuff. Tony, Max, and Ginger. And the drums were on a 20 foot riser. So everybody could see and every in the percussion world was down below and drums were up and down. Max was at the other end of the stadium. And when I say stadium, I mean, this is, you can look it up. It's in Verona. It's huge. Hmm. Um, Romeo and Juliet, Verona, Italy. So hmm. I'm on stage with Tony and he leans over and he says, tell Max, I'm not going to play. <laughs> and I'm thinking, what? Yeah. Wow. Tell Max, yeah. I'm not going to play. I don't want my drums up there. I don't want to be up on that. You got to, Tell Max I'm not going to play. So I look and there's Max, you know, a football field away. So I run across the whole stadium, run up the stairs like Rocky, get up to the top where Max is sitting. Max, Tony says he's not going to play. He doesn't want to play with the drums up on the right. Doesn't, you know. All right. Well, tell Tony that he's got to do it. So back down I go. Go up to Tony. <laughs> Max says you got to do it. Tell Max I'm not going to do it. Sends me back. This happened back and forth. So finally, Max says, fine. Tell Tony we'll set his drums up down below on the stage. He doesn't have to be up on the big riser. 20 feet up, doesn't have to be. So I come back all the way to Tony and I go, Max agreed. You don't have to be up on the riser. You can be on the stage. And Tony looks over and goes, nah, tell Max I'll play up on the riser. (laughs) So, you know. If only cell phones existed you know, through I mean, your the, entire early career. Yeah, it was running back easier. and forth, being, being, you know, having fun with Tony <laughs> Williams. Yeah, he was. Yeah. And I've told similar stories. Not, I mean, that's an actual story. But when you work with Tony or for Tony or however you want to put it, he wants 110 out of you. But he's giving 110 himself. It's not as if he goes... All right, Mulgrew Miller, you're going to play 110%, and Ira Coleman, you're going to, and you're going to run around, and you're going to do all, and and I'm going to sit back because I'm Tony. No, no, Tony was 110 as well. There was no yeah, yeah. half-assing it, you know. Yeah, he was th- for sure passionate and drumming, and you know. So back to I think the original point of this whole thing was Tony's gear, the DW drums. To you know, before we go off on some other tangent, and I say sure. something stupid. All collectors maple. They were maple shells. The snare, the six and a half by fourteen, were the Craviato solids. When Craviato was working with DW, those were Craviato solids. They were twelve lugs. So Tony's snares, the six and a halfs, twelve lugs. That was something that he wanted, and John and Don did it. And you can see it in the photos because there's that photo of him playing the snare drum. The DW and TW, you know, the workshop photo, you, that, those lugs going, you can't, that's not a 10 lug snare. That's 12. Was a uh, 42 strand with, did he still do the super wide snares on the bottom? Yes. And, 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 um, <laughs> one day <laughs> I'm going to hell. He's going to kill me. One day <laughs> I didn't like the sound of the snares. I was, you know, right or wrong. I don't know. Uh, but. Uh, he wanted 42 strands and I said, okay. And I said, I'm going to try an experiment. And I took the 42 and I clipped a couple of the outer wires off because on a 42, when you turn a snare over and you look at those wires, the outer ones, if that weld is not right, they don't pull straight. They sag, they get the, cause it's a wide thing for a tiny little strap to pull. So one sure. of the, one of the days we do work, it, they bothered me. So I clipped the two. And so we had a modified 42 and I think it became a 38 for that one thing, huh. but 42. Yeah. So snare wires, 42. Absolutely. 42. Yeah. Love Which is them. tough for most people to like rein in and handle. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of, uh, there's a, know, there. There. Yeah. there's a lot of buzz there. There's yeah. a lot of buzz. There's a lot of buzz. There's there could be a lot of buzz with that. But yeah, there's yeah. in all and in, in this huge stack of, you know, notes and everything. It uh, you know, you'll I'll be you'll see my scribble or something I typed up 42 strands, 42 strands, you know, 
we had 42 strand wires all the time. Yeah. There's a photo that you and Paul showed or Paul showed where it showed one of his snares turned over 42 strands. Yeah. Yeah. There's a few. And it was like, you kind of have to look and that's, there's something, there's kind of the mystique about Tony too, with those early days and years where they're not as well documented, which right. adds with a lot of drummers, even Bonham and those guys were like, you can't see everything. Everything's not shared. Right. And that, kind of adds the cool factor yeah to it. i mean it used to be that you know you go to concerts and the and the photographer in the pit had first three songs and then you were kicked out now bands yeah. are going come out on stage with me and then at the end we're going to turn in our backs to the audience and everybody's in the photo yeah yeah totally different you know it's just yeah i mean there's absolutely it's like it's turned completely i mean you'd have to take a picture and get lucky if you got a photo of somebody in action you know because flash bulbs yeah, drove, it, you know, you're in jazz clubs and, you know, people would go drive you crazy. Yeah, it drives. It is. It is maddening. But it's um, uh, what the what we do have now. I mean, literally, we're talking there's a there's a four part series about it based on some of these photos. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like it's just become part of history. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I just want to make sure we're not forgetting anything. Yeah, I no, think with I the mean, DW era, it's not that long of no, a period. No, unfortunately it not. It was three years. Yeah. Nine. I mean, the first, the, the first paperwork I have shows, you know, cause not, here's the 94 order for the yellow lacquer kit with the red hardware, which this is the Glasgow Scotland kit, which is, if you go online, you can see that clinic it's a zildjian event that sure. that kit originated by john good in a conversation with tony in 94 so nine and here's ah, <laughs> 18 by 24 right kick drum pzm installed sure you know so there's a there's a note that we had um so 94 drummers collective that photo from the drummers collective that kit here here's the write-up nine by twelve 10 by 13 are the rack toms. So that f if somebody's looking online, 14, 14 floor tom, 14, 16 floor tom, and 14, 18 floor tom, 18, 24, and a six and a half by 14 solid snare, which was the Craviato snare. Yellow lacquer, red hardware, black dot heads. And it says ship to drummers collective. If somebody wants to know what those, this is it right here. Wow. Yeah. So Man. 94, here's a, here's a write up for 95. This was the big LA kit soul train. When he played soul train, it, it mirrors the collective nine by 12, 10 by 13, 14, 14, 14, 16, 14, 18, 18, 24, six and a half by 14. So those were, those became his, those were the majority of the sizes. Then when that gigantic kit that I sat behind that had the combination of things, that became 9 by 12, 9 by 13, 10 by 13, 14, 14, 14, 16, 14, 18, the 11 by 14 floor tom with that that's in that picture of the funny position, two 1824s, that's the big kit at home. That was the San Francisco kit. That became a giant kit. Giant kit. Yeah. And this was my yeah. facts to John Good about the sizes. And so those are Tony's sizes. Wow. The third the your, 12 and the your 13. Your notes are your notes are like a part of Tony history. I mean, obviously they are. I mean they're I, I had to yeah. because you know, when we went to the studio and after we put the back to that cigar smoking situation, you know, <laughs> I'm sitting there and I'm setting up the kit, and I also set up an ashtray next to him, a pedestal ashtray. And I hear, oh, you know, he's not going to smoke in here. And I go, yeah, he is. You know, <laughs> I'm yeah. telling you right now, there's cigar smoke in here. I'm just telling you. And, you know, Neumanns are hanging over us. And Tony comes in and sits oh, yeah. down and puffs on the cigar. And up goes the smoke right into the microphone. And I go. Right into a right U87 in. or yeah, something. It was, yeah. <laughs> and, and so this was the recording of um, Wilderness. When the, we did this, the, the, symph the orchestra stuff at a different studio for a full orchestra and a high ceiling. Um, that's when I got yelled at about the symbols. Um, but it wasn't my fault. And there's a, and I'll tell you the story <laughs> when we set up in the studio and once his kit was set up, I would lay on the floor next to him off to his hi hat with, I'd lie there and I had a pad of paper, you know, the, the typical yellow pad of paper or 
those, um, you know, the, the journal books, they're red or black checkered looking. Yeah. 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 Like a composition book or whatever. Yeah. uh, Yeah. The composition book. I got, I got the, my original composition book that I had classic. Yeah. You know, here's, yeah, it's still he probably yes and he probably appreciated i mean clearly he did because he came back when he said you're still here kid or whatever yeah, yeah. And like why are you he, still he, here he, yeah. what he are you still doing that. here <laughs> i don't know yeah. it makes sense yeah yeah so here it is yeah. here's my meat composition book start of clinic tour september 22nd 1996 so you know i would sit on the ground next to him because after each take or some, he was, cause he was always working on the music. He would lean mm. over and say, blah, blah, you know, remind me to change high, you know, whatever it was yeah. that was relevant to that recording, whether it was the song or the whole session or just maybe a session down the road, whatever it was, he would lean over. I would write it. And we had That's notes. Incredible. And, and, yeah. and that's kind of probably why I've got a huge stack of paper everywhere because I wrote it all down. And then when we tour in, at hotels, I, if I, I got up early, I just wake up early. So every day I would, I knew where his room was. I'd write on a piece of paper, what the schedule was. We have an, we have to go to Letterman. The car's picking you up at 11, you know, whatever it was. And then I would say, I've run to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> you know, and I'd slip it <laughs> under his door. So when he got up, because we didn't have cell phone, I didn't have a cell phone. They yeah, didn't have no, a beeper no. then. So he'd get up and there would be a piece of paper slipped under his door that would say, here's a reminder of what's today. I'm going to find steak and a, you know, coffee, whatever it was. Yeah. So, you know, you're, you're talking about symbol story and w- this is a quick segue to waste more time of your night. Um, when we got into the symbols and we changed out the K ride to an A custom. And we did a couple other things, but the the 15 inch high hats stayed 15 inch high hats. Once we got those symbols, you know, cause we'd get a hold of John King at Zildjian and we'd ask for some, and we'd pick them out and then we'd send back all the symbols that we didn't need. There was no need to keep the symbols. So we honed it into what became the, the A custom setup, a custom here. And the, the, and I yeah. said, and he said, this is it. This is what we're bringing to LA to record wilderness on. Leave the K's at home. Okay. <laughs> Off we go. <laughs> we're at, God, I don't, I think it was O. Henry studio. I think the O. Henry was big enough to have the orchestra. Somebody will correct me if I'm wrong. Sure. You'll hear. Yeah. yeah. So the symphony, the whole orchestra is in there. Tony had written the whole thing. And so I took his kit and set it up in a vocal booth near the uh, console. So he's t- in the console room listening to the orchestra play. And I set his kit up as kind of like a visual so he could look over at it and know that he wasn't going to play it. It was because the orchestra was doing all of the music for Wilderness. But I put it there kind of like it's there, you know, just I'm going to set it yeah. up. Uh, yeah it's a reference it's a security whatever it is comfort there you go comfort it's it's that it's that just so you know (laughs) i thought i did a good thing oh you know look at me i'm smart (laughs) at the end of the thing at the end of the day i don't even know what day it was maybe it was the last day or whatever day it was he notices that it's the a custom symbol setup not the k and we're outside the studio and the thunder came down on me. I mean, I was oh, standing. What? I mean, whatever effing words you want to use are coming out and you've got a man angry, cigar, finger pointing, and he's going, you are going to walk back to San Francisco, grab those K's and you are going to walk back to L. I mean, it was not a joke. It was man, but he's not playing though. No, They're he's not playing. Dude, I just, but you know, and I'm sitting there going, okay, breathe. And, and this is just, and Colleen, yeah. his wife is there. And I said, okay, you said now moving forward, a custom setup is what we're using. And you yeah, agree. I, I flipped that in my mind, but no, that is yeah. what he said. That's what he said. Okay. And he was just, fuming and oh and then colleen leaned in and said you know he's right tony and that was it 
but for some reason, something, tr- you know, look, you, you spend time yeah. with somebody, somebody, you're going to say something that you're not happy that you said it. You're, you're going to receive something that you shouldn't have received. Everybody's yeah. guilty of saying the wrong thing or receiving the wrong thing. It's yes. what you do after it's how you, if, if we were in the schoolyard and I remember this as a kid, you got in a fist fight with Pat, right? Whoever yeah. Pat is at the end of the day, you're at his house or he's at your house and you're playing hot wheels. That's what happens. You, you, you've got a relationship with somebody and something is said, something is done. You have to move on with it. You have to be able yeah. to go past because if you can't go past, it's over at that point. And yeah. And so we, and you're so close to him that it's, he's, you're, you only, you're kind of mad or you, you treat people you're closest to different than you do people who are kind of just on the fringe of like friendship. Right. It's almost a compliment that he got. Yeah. yeah. Felt that comfortable sure. to you. Sure. I'll take it. Yeah. Didn't feel like yeah. it. I'm sure. Not at the but. time I was like, that's a long walk from LA to San Francisco. <laughs> yeah. Do you not know? Yeah. That's a long yeah. walk. So, you know, it's, uh, Again, we're we're telling more Tony yeah. stories than we are drums, but I'm trying to incorporate, you know, what no, happened I mean, I, when D yeah. you know, because it was important to Tony and how he evolved and things were happening and you know, keep repeating this stuff and you can chuck it out as you want. But yeah, there are sure. little things there that are on Tony's DW kit that were not part of the Gretsch. It's just they weren't. Gretsch was what Gretsch was. And when he got to DW, there were changes. The number of drums, the sizes of the drums, the snare with yep. 12 lug. I mean, there were significant. Hardware, all that. Yeah. 1824 yep. kick drums. That's a big ass kick drum. 1824. Yeah, I sure. play in 1824, but I'm playing, you know, 24, 13, 18 floor tom. Just, you know, Tony's playing 24 and he's feathering the bass drum and that <laughs> yeah. maple, you know, and you're like, what? I hear something. And then it explodes yeah, with the wide symbol. You know, that talent and passion made the drums sing and maple shells dw collectors maple shells are part of it it's just that simple that's that yeah. sound later on became that sound um yeah so man unbelievable you know, well but you know uh, yell yeah. that for symbols there you go no it's okay though but you seem like you you've taken it all in stride and are speaking very highly of him and it was uh, without a doubt i'm sure that was uh, a highlight of your life was working oh, with when, Tony when tra- I, mean, I mean, oh my God. I, you know, he taught me so much that you, 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 you don't realize it, but you carry it with you every day. It's those things that you carry inside of you, you know, yeah. father figure, if you want a mentor, uh, again, I didn't study from him. I didn't work for him to, get drum lessons from him. I didn't, you know, it wasn't in my wheelhouse to do Swiss triplets. I worked with Tony because he asked me, because he did his research on me, which was flattering. Yeah. And said, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I went, yes. And I didn't have any ulterior motive. I wanted to be part of that situation because it doesn't come around that often. No. I mean, I walked out of a class at San Francisco state. I was in the argument with the teacher a little bit. It was a music history class and the teacher was talking about music. And I went, you are so, you know, like, where are you going with this? You know, are you crazy? <laughs> and here I am, you know, and he says, you know, and he's giving me the finger, like, you know, you understand you're at school. And then, and I said, I have a chance to go out and tour with Tony Williams. And you're talking about, you know, somebody I'm going to go do this. And I took off yeah, from you're the class. Being a part of music history. Yeah, I took yeah. off from the class. Yeah. You know, I left. So, yeah. you know, um, and if, if somebody gets a hold of you later on, or if there's a chance that I can come back, like if you get a round table oh, sure. going with Paul and Bissonette and John to Christopher, maybe we can even get John Good. You know, I, I talk to John yeah. all the time. Um, but John and Don did that huge conversation that's online, you know, at the 50th, where they pulled me up on stage and there's a lot of talk about Tony. Um, I don't want to bore people with Tony, but I want people to understand that you got to jump in and start listening to everything. Get the, get the, get the Spock, listen to Spock, listen, you know, go get those albums, find them somehow, get the music and listen to them. Even if you go, what the hell is that? Again, listen with your ears, close your eyes, Yeah. then open your eyes and you'll hear it a different way. Hmm. And 
drum time, you hear the evolution of the drums, you know, up to sure. all maple and everything that he became. Yeah. It's awesome. Absolutely. That's a perfect way to kind of wrap this up yeah. because I mean, it's, uh, I, this entire thing, and I would love to do that, like a roundtable type thing. I mean, this is a four episode mega deep dive into his gear, right. but it's more than that when it gets into who he is, things beyond the gear, yeah. the plane. And there is a biography episode that I've plugged before yeah. that people can check out. But um, and if but, if, if people yeah. email you later on and go, hey, I didn't catch what those sizes were, just get a hold of me, and I'll or you know, you, or go back and I'll I'll email you the you know the yeah, first yeah, yeah. big kid at Tony's place. You know, it's. The 9, 12, 9, 13, people, 10, 13, rack Tom at 10, 13, rack Tom, two 13s right there, you know? <laughs> yeah, it's unbelievable. And I mean, I, what I appreciate about this is your willingness to help and be on this right now. It's 10 30 on a Monday night when we're doing this, yeah. we are yeah. complete drum nerds. Yeah, we're talking about drums this. though. I mean, that's, you know, yeah. it's, it's, it's drums are a, f- a physical and mental therapy. I mean, yeah, it's, you know, there's a drum addiction out there and that's fine. You know, oh yeah, you know, we we have it. Yeah, I've got a <laughs> snare right drum. Place. Well, I don't have that snare drum. Well, I want that yeah. snare drum. You know, are you going to play it very much? No, nah, maybe I might hit it, but, but I want it, it on a shelf. But I want it to see. But it just sits there. Yeah, it just sits there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I look at it. You know? That's exactly. Yeah. Well, uh, Garrison, as we finish up here, yeah. is there anything you want to plug personally? I know. I mean, you're with DW. Yeah. But like, I think I you know, <laughs> DW stuff. I yacked about personally. DW enough and Don. I mean, I, I didn't, but I didn't do it as a plug. You have to. You have to understand no, I that totally understand that, that when yes. when Tony passed away and DW, you know, hired me, um, I got to work and I still do with Don and John. I mean, these are two guys that, like Tony, taking the evolution of drumming to another level, they took the evolution of making drums to another level, and they still do. John, John, you you get on the phone with John, or if you run into John at the at the shop. You know, he'll go, I got a new wood coming in. You got to see this thing. He, you know, you run into Don. Still excited. Yeah, he's still excited. You run into Don over at the other building at the channel. He's like, oh, sorry, I got to go make a recording. I'm working with Thomas Langer. I'm working with so-and-so. But Don and John, passion. They have a deep-seated passion for drumming, musicians, music, community, education. Tony, same way passion for music education he wanted that whole series on education you know get your vhs kids you know yeah yeah. get yeah. that funny little red tool and tighten it up um, exactly that was my child right <laughs> horizontal hold horizontal hold yeah so uh <laughs> it's there's i'm not to plug anything i would just simply to to the only thing i could plug not so much to plug it but i want to thank you i want to thank you and paul thank you and thank paul for you know emailing a while ago going, Hey, I got questions about Tony. And I went, well, we're going to talk about that. You know, um, <laughs> started the whole thing. Well, yeah, you, really. You, I mean, this is all, yeah. You know, yeah. that was, that was me kind of being, I'm not going to tell you, I'd rather tell the person that wants to know. I'm glad it worked out the way it did where you came on. Cause honestly it breaks it up a little too. And, yeah. uh, like I said, we cannot get this information from anyone else. Yeah. So, now, and Paul's a great yeah. guy. I'm not, uh, look, absolutely. So I love that information he found just great. It was awesome. Yeah. So I thank you and I thank Paul. Well, thank you very much. And I appreciate everyone listening. I'd love to see people comment and just, you know, tell Garrison how you like it in the comments and everything and, and, and add info. If you saw clinics, love hearing when people say they saw clinics and things like that. So, so comment and all that stuff. But anyway, Garrison, I appreciate you being here, my friend, and I hope to meet you in person. Absolutely. uh, Yeah. Thanks for your time, man. Thank you.